In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at one of the upcoming D&D killers. This video is sponsored by Chepeku Maps. More on them later. Greetings gamers, I'm Anto and I'm definitely not three cobbles in a trench coat and today we're going to be taking a look at DC20, one of the upcoming D&D 5e killers that is being touted about as being a replacement for your 5th edition games. Now this system is being developed by The Dungeon Coach, a fellow YouTuber, and I've wanted to check it out for a little while and I recently had a week off from doing any work so I thought I'd read through the rules, dive into it a little bit, and make a video talking about the system and give you my first impressions on it. Now I've yet to actually play any games of DC20, so take that with a grain of salt. These really are my first impressions of the system. I'm going to be going through broadly what the game is and then what I think of it, the good, the bad and the ugly, give you some opinions and then start a conversation, see what you think about the system and how it sounds down in the comments below. There's timestamps underneath for you to be able to jump around to the bits that you're interested in, but let's dive straight into it. So DC20 is a high fantasy TTRPG system based on D20 roll high against a target number. So very much intended to be a replacement for D&D 5th edition. Now, anytime you have a system that fills that niche you have to ask yourself what is this game doing different to fifth edition that is going to make the typical table want to play it instead of fifth edition i know for plenty of people playing a fifth edition style game that isn't made by wizards of the coast is reason enough to play another system but in speaking to a lot of players who aren't as kind of terminally online as I am, a lot of people have never heard of these systems, just really aren't aware of what's going on with WotC as a company, and don't really engage with D&D beyond what happens at their own table. So getting them to switch from 5th edition, or even getting them to consider switching from 5th edition, is a tall ask. So anytime a new system like this comes onto the scene, I'm always thinking, what is it? about this system that's gonna make people want to switch. Now I have some notes on my tablet here because there's a lot to cover in an entire system and I don't wanna miss anything or misrepresent anything too egregiously because I don't think that would be fair. So I will be kind of checking in on my notes as we go through this. But to start with, let's give you a kind of overview of what the DC20 system is. So DC20 is a D20 system. You roll a D20 for most of your actions. You compare that to a target number. And if you meet or beat the target number, you succeed on the things you're trying to do. If you've played basically any edition of D&D, you'll be super familiar with this concept. It is used in hundreds of games within the TTRPG sphere, so it's very familiar territory. One of the main selling points for DC20 is its action point system, very similar to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. The action economy in DC20 is often talked about as being one of its major strengths. DC20 has a four action point system, and what makes it different to the likes of Pathfinder is instead of kind of dictating how you use your actions, it gives you four action points and basically says use them however you want for whatever you want. So you get four action points on each turn and those encompass the things that you want to do on your turn, but they also encompass reactions. So you can use all four of your action points as reactions if you want to. So on your turn, your action points can be spent to do things like attack and make maneuvers and make checks, help your allies, do all the typical things you'd expect to be able to do. And then off your turn, your actions can be used to do reactive things like attack of opportunity, you can use them to help your allies move out of the way of different things there's a bunch of different ways that you can use them and at least on paper it seems like a really good way to keep a player engaged outside of their turn because there is more opportunity for them to interact with the flow of combat outside of their own team. The other thing that DC20 does to differentiate itself from the other players in the space is the way that combat resolution works. So when you roll to make an attack, for example, 
you don't roll damage. Instead, all of the damage is dictated by how high you roll on your attack. If you roll and just meet the target's AC, you will deal an amount of damage as dictated by your weapon or the spell or whatever else it is. If you roll five above the target number, that's known as a heavy hit, I believe it is, and you deal additional damage. If you roll 10 above the target number, you that is known as a brutal hit, I think, and you deal even more damage. And then for every additional five over the target number that you roll, you deal even more damage or succeed even greater. And that's one way to make those really impressively high rolls feel really impactful. I really like that about the system. When you combine it with some of the other ways to get inspiration and advantage and get bonuses from allies, you can really start to get big, big numbers, which feels really good when those directly translate into more damage. Another key element of the DC20 system is the casting system. So rather than using spell slots, the DC20 system uses a mana pool, so it's similar to some of the alternate rules that you'll see in the likes of the DMG, where every spellcaster has a pool of mana that they can use to spend on their spells, but then you can also spend mana to change your spells as well. So you can increase the range or the area of effect, increase the damage, change the parameters of them, very similar to how sorcerers in 5th edition get their metamagic and can mutate their spells. That's something that's much more readily available to just all casters in DC20. But it's not just casters that get it good in DC20. Marshals have got a lot more options and marshals get a pool of stats stamina points that they can use on maneuvers and techniques and they can do all kind of things similar to a battle master fighter it basically turns every marshal into a battle master fighter in some form and they get a bunch of different options that allow them to do cool things in combat. Then there is the prime attribute system. So when you're making a character in DC20, you designate one of your attributes to be the prime attribute. That's whatever is highest. And then that is what you use in combat. It's what you use to make attack rolls. It's what you use to cast your spells with. So you can have characters who are intelligence fighters, who are strength-based casters, and it really opens up the flexibility to be able to make the kind of characters that you want, which I really like, without punishing you in combat. There are still some skill-based stuff and save-based stuff that where you'll want to kind of follow the archetype and playing against type might be a detriment outside of combat, but for just rolling your most common attacks and doing your most regular thing in combat, playing against type isn't punished, which is really nice. And then the last major point of the core system that I think is really worth noting is the ancestry system. So the way the ancestry system works is you have a number of ancestry points to spend. You get five ancestry points at level one and you can basically spend them however you like. You can go and choose to be a human and buy five points worth of ancestry traits from the human list and all of the different options have a different points cost associated to them so more mechanically beneficial things will cost more ancestry points and that kind of stuff or you can split and make a choice of two different ancestries and make a mixed ancestry character by choosing to spend your points across two ancestries getting the mechanical benefits that you want from both of them. And that's a really, I think, elegant solution to the mixed ancestry system and to choosing the mechanical benefits from different ancestries. It's a really nice solution that I really, really like. So it's a really broad overview of what makes DC20 mostly different to something like fifth edition. So now I wanna dive in and I wanna talk about my experiences reading through the rules and what I think of as kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly of the system. This video is sponsored by Che Peku Maps. Che Peku have been a longtime supporter of the channel and for good reason, they make some of the most impressive maps available on the market. Anytime I need a map for one of my sessions, the first place I go is to Che Peku's website where they have this amazing 
amazing map searcher where you can go and search by different terrain types or different vibes for your map, find a selection of them, click on it, and then you can see all of the different variations that they have there. Each Shaipaku map typically comes with a bunch of different variations, giving you day and night options, different versions for different weather effects, different states for battlefields and things like that. So you have a bunch of different options for each map, depending on what you need for your campaign. I am currently using the Wizard's Vault map to prepare a massive heist for my players where they're going to go and steal a magical artifact. And it's been a lot of fun to take these multiple connected maps and plan out this Ocean's Eleven style heist for my players. If you sign up to Chepeku's Patreon, you're gonna get thousands of map images from across their catalog. And at the higher tiers, you also get integration for VTTs like Foundry, which is what I use to be able to load them in as module packs and just use them in Foundry with all of the lighting and the walls pre-baked in. It saves me so much time every week at game night to be able to just look for one of the maps on the Chepeku website, find something that works for me for that week and then load it into Foundry ready for my players. I'll leave a link down to the Chepeku Patreon down in the description below, but for now, back to the video. So I want to start with the, the bad stuff because I never want to be accused of being just a rampant fanboy and showing too much YouTube solidarity. The biggest bad thing is the name of the system. DC20 is a terrible name. I'm sorry, coach. I'm so sorry, but it's an awful name. There is no way that I would walk into a game store and see a game called DC20 on the shelf and I probably wouldn't even look at it. It doesn't evoke anything. There is power in a name and DC20 tells me nothing other than it's likely a D20 based system. But most systems are D20 based systems and that doesn't set it apart. It doesn't give me any inspiration about genre, tone, setting, the vibe. So many super successful games have names that evoke something about their core system. It was my biggest problem when MCDM went and ran their crowdfunding campaign for their RPG and they didn't put a name on it. I think it means that you are unlikely to push out beyond your own audience or beyond the audience of your audience and you're not going to have as many people kind of stumble across it like critical role could easily have just called their game like cr whatever cr 12 i guess they're not a d20 system are they critical role 12 it's a critical role game that uses 12 sided dice it's a lot less cool of a name than dagger heart though isn't it and i just think that the the, the game will struggle because it doesn't have a name because in my mind, games named like that aren't named. Another thing I'm not a fan of is not rolling for damage. I understand why from the perspective of we're taking away this dice roll because it feels bad when you score a critical and then roll two ones. It feels bad when you roll a d12 and you roll a one. And I also understand the element of, oh, if every damage, if every weapon deals a flat damage, it makes it really easy for us to calculate the maths. It makes a very flat system, makes a very mechanically balanced system. But players love rolling dice when i brought this to my group and was discussing it with them every single one of them immediately bounced off it as soon as i mentioned the fact that you don't roll damage all of them were like that is not for me you know you are targeting this game directly to compete with fifth edition dungeons and dragons a game that has rolled for damage its entire lifespan most of the people who play fifth edition have only ever played 5th edition. They have only ever rolled for damage. That's a big departure to say you get to roll fewer dice. It, I feel like you could have, especially with the fact that rolling high on your attack increases the amount of damage that you do, that would mitigate rolling low on the dice. If I roll a 1 on my damage dice, but I rolled 15 over on what I needed to hit, and got an extra three damage on my damage dice anyway that takes the sting away the feels bad from rolling low that takes a lot of that away anyway and you just adjust the monster hit points based on the average damages it wouldn't have been a huge amount of extra math work 
based on just taking the average damages and people could still have rolled dice and i think that it would have been another barrier removed to stop people from bouncing off the game similarly the multiple attack penalty that you get so you get disadvantage on your second attack i don't think that was necessary to include in the game yes you can mitigate it by using an action point to give yourself advantage but when i presented that to my players they're like if i can use an action point to give myself an advantage what's the point of me getting disadvantage for multiple attack penalties i hate it most of my players that have played pathfinder second edition pathfinder first edition any game with the multiple attack penalty hate multiple attack penalties as it is understand why designers feel the need to put it in because you want to encourage other options but just make your other options cooler like if someone wants to stand there and attack three times let them stand there and attack three times if that is what they want to do that's what they're going to do even with multiple attack penalties a lot of the time that's what people end up doing but they kind of resent doing it because they're getting penalized for it and that is in itself a feels bad similarly only marshals uh get in reactions attack of opportunity reactions pathfinder second edition does this every time it happens and someone moves away from a character that doesn't have this it feels bad for them especially coming from fifth edition and again i'm approaching this from the point of view that most of your kind of perspective players for this system are fifth edition players and then the last thing that i am really not a fan of is monster presentation so there aren't many monsters presented um i don't think there are any in the core rules it's all presentation in the adventure that was included in the pack that i got so i don't know if this is going to be the final presentation i really hope not but the presentation of monsters is very stripped back it reminds me a lot of shadow dark a lot of osr style monster presentation very very minimalist and it is not something that i like at all i probably should make a video on this because bob Wilbuilder did a video talking about stat blocks and this kind of thing recently and i had a lot of opinions on that as well so i probably will make a video on monster stat blocks soon but essentially when a player looks at this stat block if you are not intimately familiar with the rules, it is just confusing. Like I had read the rules and I looked at this stat block and immediately I was like, eh? okay, I, th I think that this means that it is a plus four to hit and it deals three damage, but I'm not certain because it doesn't say it. And then I still had to read, had to read through the stat block multiple times and I'm still not certain that everything in it, it does what I think it does because there's a lot of natural language missing. People give 5th edition a hard time for its use of natural language, but it is very difficult to misinterpret what a 5th edition stat box says. When it says that something is a melee attack with a range of 5 feet that targets one creature that has a plus 8 to hit and then deals 9 damage plus 4 damage for slashing, it's hard. It is hard to misinterpret that. It takes up a lot more space on the page, for sure, but anyone that has got even the tiniest amount of experience with the system can look at that and understand what it means. It removes a barrier to entry, to being able to run the system. And I think there's this feeling that, oh, by stripping down the monster stat block, we speed up play. And that is true once your GMs reach a certain level of proficiency with the system. Until that point, you are slowing them down. And once they get to that level of proficiency, a longer stat block isn't slowing them down anyway because they know what parts of the stat block to ignore. Like I can look at a fifth edition stat block and I know which chunks I can ignore and where in a stat block to look to get the key information and how to read a fifth edition stat block as though it was one of those more condensed ones. Whereas you can't do the reverse and put more information into that minimalist one as a new GM who doesn't have that context. That might be a personal thing. I'd love to know what you folks think down in the comments below about minimalist versus maximalist creature stat block design, whether you prefer to have a lot of information on that. I am very much in the camp of give me as much information as I need to run it and don't take things away from me 
as a GM, but I want to know what you think. But with my negatives of the system out of the way, let's talk about some of my positives. This list is much bigger. So let's just dive into it. Four actions and the way the four action economy works. Love it. Think it's really cool. I even prefer it to the Pathfinder three action economy, which I was really a fan of. I like the ability to use my actions however I want, to spend them on my turn, to spend them outside of my turn as reactions. I really like the ability to just give myself advantage as an action point whenever I want and to stack that. The stacking advantages system is really nice. Being able to have multiple advantage and roll say three dice choose the highest or four dice choose the highest that creates situations where you can have really interesting gameplay elements between yourself and your teammates where your teammates could spend action points to help you which gives you a d8 to add to your role let's say you've got a party of five players and you are making an attack against the the big bad and you know that this attack has to hit you only need to make one hit but it has to hit so you spend one action to make a strike, three actions to give yourself three stacks of advantage on it, and then all four of your friends spend an action point to give you, to aid you and give you 4d8 to add to your dice roll to that. So you'd end up rolling 4d20, keep the highest, and then adding 4d8 to that roll. So chances are your end result in roll is going to be very, very high, which means you should do a bunch of extra damage representing that kind of lend me your energy, super dramatic strike. There's a lot of drama baked into that system, which I really, really like. I wish there was some drama in having a dice roll for the damage, but aside from that, there is a lot of drama in the system that I really, really like. Prime attribute system is really nice, not getting penalized for making different choices, being able to choose to play against type. I really, really like that. The dynamic save system, so when there's different outcomes for you scoring a hit or a miss and your opponent saving or failing against that hit or miss, they're creating four different degrees of success reminds me a lot of pathfinder i really like that dynamic the way that that interplays between itself i really like the way that death works so your death threshold is your prime attribute so at level one it's going to be minus three and when you roll death saves you go down by one and if you take massive damage that can put you over it and you can just instantly die but i like that when you're at zero hp you still have one action point so you're not unconscious you are just bleeding out you're in the process of dying but you can still do stuff that is really nice i really like the stamina system for marshals and i like that they regain their stamina in different ways so the barbarian regaining their stamina by taking big hits and leaning into that ferocity is really nice there's a lot of interesting design space around that system that i really really like i really like the spell customization with the mana points that whole subsystem of the rules being able to change your spells heighten spells with extra mana points change different elements of your spells is really cool i could see that designing new spells would be a lot of fun by changing up how you spend mana on them. Another thing that I think is really cool that I don't think would come up in a lot of games um, based on the way I've seen it being run typically is the language system. So you put points into languages and if you put one point into a language you can speak it in a broken capacity and if you put two points you can speak it fluently. So it is possible for you to speak multiple languages but not fluently so you not get all of the information from the language and that's a really nice little role play element to get codified in rules to remind you and the game master that that's a thing and you can get really fun interactions between conversing with people in different languages and you speak in broken versions of that languages and only getting partial 
bits of information from that. I really liked that system. I thought it was a really interesting way of approaching languages to not just get a, oh, you suddenly know this entire language. And speaking of marshals, I also really like that you can modify your attacks. So you can choose to make an attack and then spend an action point to add a maneuver to it, spend another action point to do other things to it. And you can spend a whole bunch of action points to make a single attack that has all of these different properties and elements to it. That is probably the thing that I like the most about the system is with the action point system and then each subsystem of the game seems really designed with the action point system in mind. There's a lot of flexibility within that both in character creation between picking all of your ancestry stuff there's a lot of character optimization but then when you get to actually play in the game at least on paper there's a lot of choices to be able to go okay, I'm going to perform this action, but I'm going to change it with using my action points to do different things. And that is really cool. Now, whether or not it would actually play out like that at the table, or whether your players would end up defaulting into a routine set of actions and go, well, the most optimum thing for me to do is hit someone and power attack with one of my action points and add a advantage onto that and then keep one action point back and that's what i'm going to do every single turn whether or not that plays out i think would largely be dependent on the players but at least on paper it's very cool so overall what do i think of dc20 i like it a lot i think if i had to describe where it sits in the current landscape of ttrpgs i would say it's like 5th edition and Pathfinder 2nd edition had a baby. It's very much in the middle ground between the two of them. And that is right in the kind of design space that I really like. And it's exactly the kind of space that I want to see explored more. 5th edition has a variety of things that irk me, which I've talked about before. And after having played Pathfinder 2nd edition for a year now, there's a bunch about that system that is too granular. It's too detailed. It's too mechanized for the sake of mechanics. And I find that it just gets in the way that the mechanics get in their own way. And having those codified rules can actually be a problem in some cases. And DC 20 seems to sit in this middle ground where it takes kind of some of the loosey goosey elements of fifth edition, but some of the stronger design principles of pf2 so the action point system the degrees of success the hitting above target numbers dealing criticals and things like that and bakes them together with a foundation of fifth edition and what you end up with is really quite a nice system. If you are interested in DC20, I will leave a link below to where you can pick up the alpha playtest packet. There is going to be a Kickstarter in a couple of weeks. It starts on June the 4th. I'll leave a link to the sign up for that as well. They're going to be launching the, the core book and getting it out of alpha and into a proper state everything that i've been looking at in the last couple of weeks has been pretty early versions of the game so there's still plenty subject to change but i'd love to know what you think of the system down in the comments below and if you want to keep watching check out this video where i take one of the elements of fifth edition that i hate the most the magic item pricing and try and fix it but until next time happy gaming